Hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Um, let's start with some presentations. So my name is Martin Fuentes. I am Senior Product Manager at Instana for Kubernetes Observability. And I am here today with my colleague, Cedric. Hey, I'm Cedric. I'm a Product Manager for our Distributed Tracing and Open Telemetry in particular. Nice to meet you all. Great. So today uh, we have a bunch of slides to share with you. We're going to talk about Kubernetes resource management. Uh, what are the different metrics that Kubernetes takes into account for uh, scheduling pods and, and containers? And what are the different scaling approaches? Uh, then I will hand it over to my colleague Cedric, uh, who is going to talk about how you can actually observe Kubernetes workloads, uh, giving an introduction to open telemetry, the different uh, ways you can instrument applications with open telemetry with some examples, and then also some uh, live demo. And with this, I will just start. Let's, uh, so as I mentioned, let's go ahead and talk about Kubernetes resource management. Uh, so when we talk about a uh, resource at Kubernetes, we mainly uh, talk about CPU and memory, and those are the, the most important resources that Kubernetes managed and the ones that are taking into account when uh, Kubernetes is scheduled pods or containers in the cluster. Um, so CPU uh, is one of them. As I mentioned, uh, one CPU unit is equivalent to one physical or virtual CPU. That's the way that uh, Kubernetes measure it. You can actually allocate a uh, fractional parts of a CPU to a workload. And the minimum uh, that you can actually uh, assign uh, or request for a, for a container is one milli CPU, which is of course the thousand part of a CPU. Then for memory, memory is measured in bytes and bytes are just bytes. <laughs> it supports uh, two different uh, suffixes. You can use quantity suffixes like beta, tera, giga, mega, kilo, and so on. And as well, it, it also supports power of two equivalents like PB bytes, the TB bytes, GB bytes, and, and so on. So there's one other resource that it's probably less uh, taken into account and less used, which is the local ephemeral storage. But for some workloads, it might be important that you make sure that uh, your container is going to run in a node that actually has this kind of storage. And it, it's uh, also uh, an, uh, enough uh, space also uh, available. Um, so it's also measured in bytes. It's also supported two different uh, quantity suffixes and, and power of two. And uh, one thing that it's important to remark, if you're actually taking uh, this uh, kind of resource uh, into account that it's uh, not guaranteed that it will be long-term uh, availability. So that's something important. And it's only about the, the ephemeral storage that lives inside the pod. Uh, so for every container uh, in your cluster, you can actually set up what it's called request and limits. Um, so the request is the minimal amount of resources, either CPU or memory that your uh, workload will need to run. And you can specify that so Kubernetes will know uh, in which node of the cluster schedule your uh, containers or pods. The limits are more or less similar, but it, it says to Kubernetes, which is the threshold that this workload shouldn't be exceeding. So it shouldn't be consuming more than X amount of CPUs or X amount of uh, bytes of memory. Um, the cube scheduler, it, which is one, of the, uh, one part of the uh, Kubernetes components will decide in which node the pod will run, depending on the uh, availability of resources in that node and the requests that were configured for that workload and for that container. Then the Kubelet will reserve at least that amount of resources that were requested in the node to make sure that uh, it's available for the container to run. And also the Kubelet will be the one enforcing that the limits are uh, respected so uh, we can prevent that other containers that are running there will uh, have less resources than they requested or they need to actually run. Now, this is how uh, uh, request and limits are actually configured for a container. Uh, so this is a very uh, simple config map with two containers running in a single pod. Uh, for each of the containers, there is a, a configuration for uh, memory and CPU requested and at the same time, limits for those same applications, as you can see here. It's very straightforward and very simple. As I mentioned, here is um, requesting uh, 64 MB bytes of memory and 250 millicores to run this uh, specific container. 
Now, what happens with requests and limits? How do they actually impact your workloads and, and the containers running there? So if a container hits the CPU limit, what Kubernetes will do is to throttle the container, meaning that the application running there will be probably less performance than it was before, but it won't be terminated or evicted. So you will have less performance, but your application will still run. Uh, on the other hand, if a container hits or exceeds the memory limit, it will be actually terminated by Kubernetes. The pod will die, and depending if the pod uh, was managed by an application controller, like a deployment stateful set or daemon set, um, Kubernetes will make sure, actually the controller will make sure to uh, spin up a replacement for that pod that just uh, died because of memory consumption. So the decided state is always uh, respected. It's important to take into account that this process could actually happen like in a loop. Uh, so you, if you have a memory leak in your application, it might happen that your application will be dying uh, very often because Kubernetes will always um, make sure that the, the memory limit is not uh, surpassed. And uh, it's important also to try to take a look at how your applications are consuming these resources against the request and limits. Um, I tried to bring this example to show that uh, it's not only important to uh, allocate as the, the minimum that your application needs, but also trying to not request more than it actually needs, because that, that resources will be reserved for the application while it will not will be actually using it. So here in this chart, for example, you see for memory consumption, the actual usage of the application is below the request. That means that there is some space here of a uh, memory that is not really used by the, the application, but is still reserved for it because it was requested. So it's really important to make sure that you have also like a visual way to, to, to see how the, the configuration of request and limits is uh, doing um, together with the consumption of those resources uh, by the application. Moving forward, I was also uh, wanting to talk about the scaling. So there are two different uh, types of scaling at Kubernetes. You have horizontal scaling that also have two different meanings, depending if it's for the node or for a pod. At the node level, it actually means adding more nodes to a given cluster. So you will have more uh, servers in that cluster to allocate uh, workloads. While at the pod level, it means that you are adding more running replicas uh, to, to an application. For example, you have um, an application that is taking requests uh, from uh, end users. And at certain point, you uh, see that the, app the application performance is degrading. So you will uh, actually spin up more, more replicas of that applications to actually allocate more uh, end user requests. And in that case, it will be horizontally scaling your pod. In the case of vertical scaling, at the node level, it actually means to modify the attributed resources of each node. So if you have, for example, a virtual machine running on a a physical server, you can mod if you modify uh, what are the resources available in that virtual machine, you are actually vertically scaling that node. And, and for a pod, it means uh, playing a bit with request and limit. So when you, uh, as I mentioned before, it's important to not request more than what your application needs. When you are doing that, this fine tune of request and limits, taking into account the, the actual consumption of your application, you are actually vertically scaling your uh, containers or pods. I would uh, also like to do a, a, a have one more slide about uh, the horizontal and vertical pod out of scaling. So focusing on pods here, uh, because at the end, that's why that that's what is going to be running in your cluster and the, the configuration that you have um, the possibility to, to impact. There is a, a, a way to automatically scale your uh, containers in Kubernetes, and uh, it's called HPA, and it, it stands for out, uh, Horizontal Pod Auto Scaling. And in that case, you can set up um, a, a query that will tell to Kubernetes, uh, on, uh, starting on which threshold, it will start spinning up or down more replicas of that uh, container that you have deployed. Um, this is uh, not possible for any uh, for all the um, uh, application controllers or workloads, uh, but you can do it for deployment stateful sets or replica set, for example. In the case of uh, vertically vertical pod auto scaling, uh, so th there is a mechanism that will allow uh, Kubernetes to dynamically adjust the CPU and memory attributes of your pods. So you will actually be, um, as I mentioned before, modifying the requests 
for that pod, but it can happen also in an automated way by Kubernetes. So now um, I also wanted to bring you a, a summary of how you would uh, look at this information or data in an observability tool. Uh, and, and it's important to mention that uh, you need to have a, like visibility for all the different components of the cluster. It's important that uh, the observability tool that you're using allows to see also not only the request and limits for specific containers or, or pods, but also uh, a kind of a summary or, or roll up of these request limits and, and resource usage uh, at different levels uh, of the cluster. You can look at that at the node level by namespace or even at the, at the, the whole cluster. With this, and probably before I hand it over uh, to my colleague Cedric, I will just take a look if there are questions. Okay, so don't really see any question from our audience. I encourage you to send us any question or doubt that you have. We're here to answer them. But it looks that there are not, so I'm handing the presentation now to my colleague Cedric to take it over. Oh, I can see. So wait, just one second, Cedric, because a uh, question just popped up. Um, so I have a question from Deepankard who asks, do we vertically, so do, do we vertical scale using Golang? So in this case, it's actually um, not depending on the technology or the language that you're using, as long as you can, you know what are the, the different resources that your application will use. You have a way to actually tell Kubernetes, which is the query that it has to run and the different thresholds. Uh, to scale up or down vertically your pods, uh, but you uh, it, it's not depending on on the um, the language that your application is writing. I hope to answer your question with this. Thank you, Dipankar. Right. Questions are always great. Let's hop to the actual observing part or is there more i see one more question do you want to uh, answer that so yeah, uh, Zuresh asks uh, during vertical scaling is the container recreated or uh, you know uh, if it yeah, if the scaling was done on the fly um so if it's an uh, auto scaling so if you're actually setting up kubernetes to uh, scale the cluster in that in that, that case it will be actually recreated Oh, sorry, no, I am talking about, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, you're talking about vertical out, uh, scaling. Uh, it's done the, dynamically, so it's not going to be uh, recreated. It's just does it on the fly. It uh, dynamically modifies the request for your, uh, for your workload, sorry. All right. Now it looks to be. Thanks. I think we can catch up with everything. Let's uh, then go to the uh, observing workloads part. And uh, I think um, this part, part deserves a bit more uh, preparation, right? We are here for observability. And um, I think we should talk about what, what we actually mean when we want to you know, establish or facilitate observability. And um, it's the same um, if whether we talk about you know, Kubernetes, if whether we talk about a more traditional scale, uh, scheduler like Nomad, or um, just your plain ho host-based application that you deploy via floppy disks or whatever. Um, so observability is actually inferring the state of a workload by looking at its inputs and outputs, right? So um, we want to uh, consume signals from a, from a given service. Um, and when we talk signals, we, we usually mean traces, metrics, and logs. And then we want to infer the state of the application. We want to uh, go analyze the logs, see if there are any errors in them. We want to take a look at the metrics, see if the numbers are healthy, for example. You know, the processing rate, uh, latency is a, is a very good measure. Um, and for tracing, actually, um, it gets a bit more interested. It's interesting, right? Um, with tracing, we usually mean distributed tracing. So it's not only one service involved in a transaction, but it's rather a distributed transaction. So you have your bank application on your mobile phone. And when you tap, you know, you, you wire some money to a friend. Um, 
the request will actually go from your mobile. It will go into you know some edge service, and from the edge service it will probably distribute it into some kind of uh, bank management system. Maybe it even goes to a to a mainframe in the seller. Um, and um, yeah, these these kinds of transactions get increasingly complex, and um, that's why the distributed part here is um, very important. We want to collect these signals from services and infrastructure that you are running, um, either inside traditional data centers or inside Kubernetes. Um, then, once you have the signals um, and you know, your services are emitting the signals, you want to uh, enable collection on them, right? So there needs to be some kind of tool that um, would catch all the traces, catch all the metrics, catch all the logs. It would maybe allow you some pro post-processing to remove um, personal information from, um, from the data. And um, then you want to store the signals. If you want to take a, a deeper look, you know, five minutes later or the other day, you need to have a storage that is capable of storing these um, these signals for you, um, which directly caters into the next part. Um, at some point in time, you will want to analyze all the signals with an, an analytical engine. And um, all in all, the you know the traditionally all that has been very um, very complex, and um, it was a uh, space that was dominated by some vendors and. Um, they did the data collection for you and they would provide the analytics engine and um, that has shifted a bit and um, let's take a look at the next slide what uh, is already in the in the title of this talk is open telemetry and um, so open telemetry is really an open standard that cares about um, observability as a whole. They care about all the different steps in the process. They have a component for collecting the data, which is called the collector, which receives, processes, and exports all the signals um, at, your, at your disposal, basically. Um, they provide some instrumentation libraries, and these are the things that are in your processes. And they, you know, um, analyze the data flow in your in your process. Uh, probably do some instrumentation on the code level, so they would be intercepting, for example, in Java via bytecode or whatever, and um, infer traces, logs, and metrics for you. And what's interesting is um, the project even provides auto instrumentation for some. Runtime such as Java, Node.js, Python, and .NET, which basically means um, removing a lot of manual work of the data collection and just including the um, you know these open telemetry in process components into your application, including the Java agent into your Java applications. The Java agent will automatically instrument your your workload, and you have minimum time to value even with this um, this open source. Um, option. Um, then the Open Telemetry project cares as well about some deployment helpers. So, um, yeah, you need to deploy all of these components. You need to uh, instrument your workloads. You need to um, deploy a collector. You need to make sure that the networking in your Kubernetes cluster is set up. All of that. And the community is taking care of that. For example, there is a Helm chart that will. Uh, deploy the, um, the collector for you. There is a, there is a um, Kubernetes operator that will auto instrument your workload. So they will do some transparent modification of your Kubernetes workload definitions and automatically inject uh, instrumentation for some runtimes, which is a really cool feature. And um, yeah, probably one of the best things that this project has established is a shared protocol. So with open telemetry, when I think about open telemetry, um, there is this open telemetry line protocol, which is available. It covers, you know, the data transmission between the collection components and a collector or a vendor. And um, this is a standard standard thing. So if you are not satisfied with your current observability solution, you know, you can you can pack, you can pack your things and just direct your workloads to report to another vendor without having to re-instrument everything, which is cool. The project is governed by the CNCF. Um, it's an open process. Everyone can participate and it's entirely open on GitHub. 
So if you're interested, um, head towards GitHub, look for open telemetry, um, tons and tons of, of, of great people and discussions there. Next slide, please. So um, let's take a look at the instrumentation. What does it actually look like? So if you are not in a position where you can or want your uh, workloads to be automatically instrumented, you are probably familiar with the case that you need to pull in a vendor library. Um, you need to you know, add some code bits um, in and around your, um, your business logic to facilitate um, collecting traces, for example, right? So we, you would need to encapsulate all of your business logic into some mechanism that would define, hey, this is a transaction, um, take care of it and export it to a observability tool. Um, with OpenTelemetry and especially with Java, this is super easy. So what I, what I brought today is um, the snippet of a, or a snippet from a Docker file. So you can see it's basically just pulling the plain open JDK 17. And then it is um, pulling from GitHub the um, open telemetry Java agent, um, which is a jar file. And then in the CMD line, we are basically incorporating that jar file. We are basically using it as a Java agent. We are attaching it to our JVM. And what that will do, it will automatically, automatically modify your code on known uh, code paths, such as popular web frameworks. Um, and it will wrap around it, do that wrapping for you basically, on, and automatically collect the, um, the trace signals in that case. And, um, you know, that's it. There is no further, further work to be done. You can enhance or, or augment your experience here with an SDK, but it's entirely optional, right? You just pull it in, um, have it work, and it will even automatically find its way to the uh, open telemetry collector. If the collector is available at the standard port, um, the connection is um, made automatically. Cool, so much for, so much for Java. Uh, I brought another example. This is not JS, it's a bit more complex. So you see that with open telemetry, the landscape is not um, homogenous. It's more, um, it's, a, it's a very diverse community and all the different projects that are at various stages of maturity. But um, automatic instrumentation is um, possible with Node.js as well. So one option would be to use their operator in Kubernetes to automatically do what's on this slide. But since we're here to learn something, um, I thought it would make sense we take a look at the snippets. So at the left-hand side, there is the Docker file once again. We pull the plain Node 17 image, um, we copy some stuff, and what you will notice is that in line 13, we are actually requiring a file that is basically prepended to everything that the, the, um, the application does. So we are requiring that Tracer.js file upfront before starting the application. And the contents is on the right-hand side. We are configuring all the telemetry here. We are configuring basically the, or specifically the node SDK portion of uh, open telemetry. And we wire um, the OTLP trace and metric exporters here. Um, you can see in line 10, line 14, they, con they can consume um, an, a canonical environment variable, which you can, uh, set on your workload so that they find their collector. And then all you have to do is, you know, start the SDK, line 24, and you're done. And by means of um, the instrumentations uh, config in line 21 and the automatic resource detection on line 20, you are covered. So what this will do is it will automatically start reporting. It will automatically recognize its environment it will detect um, whether you are running on GCP, whether you are running on AWS, in a Lambda function, in a Fargate uh, container, in an Azure function, or in a Google Cloud Run container. That's facilitated by means of um, resource detectors. And every signal will be annotated with this information so that you can easily consume it later down the road. And um, the auto instru instrumentation registration in 9.21 just make sure that you know standard libraries in the node uh, runtime 
and even some community libraries are automatically instrumented. So when you have an express app and you um, you invoke a controller or a route that you have, um, it will automatically collect span data for you. So collect trace data. Cool, that's it. And, and that's really it. Instrumentation is done. Next slide, please. So if you want to learn more about instrumentation, we have a demo application out on GitHub. It's uh, github.com slash instana slash hotel shop. Uh, we have some examples for Java, Python, uh, Node.js, um, even Golang, um, a instrumented Nginx, a instrumented uh, page two web server. And uh, you can check the project out. I think and the examples are fairly straightforward. And by that, let's uh, check out if there are any questions. What about Golang? Is auto instrumentation available? Great question. <laughs> Why is the question great? Go, Go is a compiled language, right? And it's, it's inherently hard to um, auto instrument these. While there are some proprietary options available for auto instrumentation, the um, Open Telemetry project is not currently at the point where they are investing into auto instrumenting and Go applications, but that could very well be an enhancement uh, driven by the community. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Next slide. So remember my first slide that uh, now we need to uh, collect all the data that our workloads are emitting. Um, and as an open telemetry collector, we have chosen uh, we've chosen a specific artifact. So instead of using the open telemetry collector, which is a project and it's a specification at the same time, um, let's deploy the Instana agent as a, an open telemetry collector. That is our host based agent basically that you would roll out onto your production systems and it would observe anything out of the box. And it can ingest open telemetry. For, for easy augmentation of our already available automatic instrumentation. So um, this specific example um, takes care of creating um, a namespace in your Kubernetes cluster. If it doesn't exist, it's on an agent, and it will then um, you know, deploy that Helm chart that is specified. It will set some default configuration. And then in, um, in the uh, second to last line, we set open telemetry dot enabled equals true. And that's all you need. That um, facilitates populating our agent in your cluster as um, an ingress point for open telemetry data. It's, um, it's addressable via a DNS name in your cluster and it listens on the standard part. So it's a really transparent process. And now combine that with um, configuring your workloads. We will take a look at that. But basically, data collection is done. You deploy the agent or any other uh, open telemetry uh, collector, and um, collection is taken care of. Next slide. Yes, configuration of Kubernetes workloads. So as I said, um, we would be really looking forward uh, towards an easy configuration. And um, in reality, all you will probably need is the OTL underscore exporter underscore OTLP underscore endpoint environment variable on the process. You modify your um, deployment or pod specification and um, you just inject this environment variable, um, make it uh, point at the internal DNS name for your open telemetry collector, which in this case refers to our agent. Um, but it could be really be any other collector. And um, in addition to that, you would set the OTAD service name uh, environment variable, which is the only required thing in open telemetry. Everything needs to be recognizable, right? So it requires us to set the service name here and it's easiest to be done um, from the outside with environment configuration. And by that, our workload configuration is done as well. Easy. Next slide. Now we are getting to the beefy part, right? So we have taken care of, of a lot of things. But now we want to analyze on our telemetry data. So you would now select the vendor of choice for your, your observability needs. And you would make sure that your collection uh, mechanism 
So your open telemetry collector, for example, would shuffle the data from your premises to the vendor, vendor's premises. And um, in this example, we already have chosen, uh, we have taken care of that decision, right? So we want we, we are in Stana and we want to use our product in that case because we know it well and how to use it and, and what value it brings. So we thought we um, we would take a few minutes on a on a sh very short demo, but basically by deploying the Instana agent, um, we already um, we already uh, yeah have an analytics backend and we already configured it. I see there is a rather large question, and I would like to address that uh, in the in the Q and A part after after the short demo. Thanks. Okay. I would. Uh, Martin, can you uh, let me share the screen? Thank you. So, this is Instana. You can all see it now. And um, this is a dashboard for, for a Kubernetes cluster. You are recognizing it because Martin already showed it to you, right? You see um, that we denote all the different object types in Kubernetes clusters here, and we, we neatly group them under specific cluster. Um, this is our demo environment, uh, which we use for um, customer presentations and webinars. So it has a bunch of um, demo data in here. And one particular thing I wanted to show you is the hotel shop in action, basically. I promised you that there would be a demo project, and um, I think this is a very good, um, very good example. So, since Instana is all about um, giving you full context um, throughout analyzing your um, your observability signals, um, you can always go from infrastructural elements like um, this Kubernetes cluster to, for example, trace data or logging data if connected, and um, Let's take a look at our analytics section, which is here. Um, and we say, hey, dear unbounded analytics feature, please give me all the uh, span data that, we, that, that you have for this specific Kubernetes cluster. And um, what it will do, it will, um, it will do it, right? <laughs> so what we, what we have here is all the trace data produced by that sp the specific cluster grouped by a namespace. And um, you can see that we recognize objects like services. So for example, the different hotel shop components, and um, we can analyze trace data for this. To get a better picture of what the hotel shop really is, let's uh, look at our applications perspective section. Application perspectives is a concept that we wrap around the uh, individual services. It's basically a way for you as a, as a customer or a user of Instana to kind of segregate your services um, into more cohesive units. So in this case, let's take a look at the uh, hotel shop, which is one of the application perspectives that I defined. Take a look at configuration first. And it's basically denoted here by means of um, the physical host uh, zone. So a ready-made dashboard for you to go analyze on the health of your application. But what is my application made of? I see something here. It says hotel, okay, open telemetry shop. Yeah, okay, probably an online shop, but what does it consist of? Um, we have a tool that we call the dependency map over here. And this is a really a, flow, a way to analyze your application data flow. So, uh, don't mind that uh, hotel shop web service over here. It's just sitting around, uh, probably doing nothing. Um, the Apache 2 instrumentation is not very mature yet. So I assume an issue with the actual instrumentation, but take a look at the hotel shop Nginx front service. By, by looking at the name, this is the your front proxy. It receives calls from a load generator and we can see all the services that it would talk to, right? Um, so a user might check out the, the shipping options for objects in your store, right? Um, they might want to change their passwords through the hotel shop user service. 
they want to rate uh, products via the um, rating service. And um, then the rating service, for example, it calls into something else. And you can see the, the tiny pop-up here. Um, this is the uh, ratings database. And the ratings database just receives calls from the rating service as it should. It's all observed, all inferred out of the box. But what do we have over here? Auto shop card. So the card service is talking to the shipping service, which makes sense because you want to know shipping options analyzed for the things that you have in your card. And we see that this is a HTTP service. And what we can do for every individual service, we go through the dashboard. And this is once again, an opinionated dashboard. Um, and we can go see all the calls that were created by the open telemetry auto instrumentation in that case. The shipping service is a, uh, it's a Java um, application. And so all of, the, all of the transactions that you can see here are automatically created. There is no additional polishing from our side, at least not that I would remember. Um, so let's take a look at this one. It's an HTTP post that was created by the auto instrumentation. And we natively blend open telemetry data alongside our auto instrumentation that we have on our more or less proprietary side of things. So you can mix and match open telemetry and, and it's done auto, auto instrumentation whenever you like. But this uh, set of services is really all about open telemetry. So here's the call graph. And now it gets interesting, right? One of the um, one of the measures of application healthy for uh, healthiness, for example, is um, call latency. So you want to know how long is my call taking, but you not only want to look at that very specific call, you also want to take a look at um, all the other other calls that were made to that endpoint. So we give give you a way to um, you know very transparently look at the numbers and see. Um, all the points in your distributed transaction. So there's a, this call, it enters through the front proxy, goes inside um, the shipping service. There is an HTTP call that's outgoing from the Nginx front to the hotel shipping service. And then there is some internal stuff happening here. There is a controller involved. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then there is a card helper involved. Yeah, so I can do a lot of with this, but imagine you are a developer or a DevOps persona and um, you want to track down a production issue. You want to see an issue with calls that happen to a specific service. And um, you can do that by means of checking a box. It's not visible right now. Let me, let me clear out some filters here. So we see that we have erroneous calls in our systems and we would like to investigate those either because we are on call and we received an issue that is being tracked or um, you know, a customer is asking why the transaction has failed. And we see that, oh my gosh, there are a lot of failed transactions. It's red. Red means contains errors. Take a look at that. Once again, the distributed transaction and we immediately see that the payment uh, service actually failed. And um, we can now infer where the, where the distributed transaction actually uh, went wrong. So we know that we have a status code error and then open telemetry, there is a specific uh, label that can be applied. So there was a, a status code 500 so something in my application's log logic is apparently wrong. So I can go now fix it. Um, and I think it's very straightforward to, to do the analysis um, over here. So that, that was a tiny glimpse into using open telemetry tracing with um, Instana. We have a lot more in store, ranging from user and user monitoring to our own tracing libraries with some more expert knowledge. Um, but I would really rec um, recommend that you check out our demo project, take a look at the instrumentation and enjoy the power of open telemetry um, and, uh, you know, make it your own.
we'll stop stop sharing the screen and take care about some questions maybe so first of all <laughs> thank you since my team uh, put up the slide thank thank you thanks a lot right uh, there's once again the link to the demo application on github and if you want to play with instana we have a demo environment accessible to um to you you can access that um, from your browser i think you don't have to really register you, you need to leave your email address and you can um you know and then play with instana in the play with environment looking at questions consider the small microservices segment below <laughs> there is a question about an SLL breach as at ingress node A and at the same time we want to find anomaly alerts in containers B5 and B8. Is there a way we can quickly plot a flow chart using the traces or any mechanism to find the issues quickly so we can find the root cause? The goal is to, to reduce the MTTR minimum time to respond and maintain the healthy SLO service level objective and use the error budget effectively. Whoa, do you so I, I I suppose you are advanced in your in your DevOps journey. So you are playing around with um, SLOs and SLIs, um, which is great. By the way, we can support you with that. Um, the question is: can you plot a flow chart using traces to find the issues? Um, yes. So it depends on your analytics engine. In theory, your um, distributed tracing provider or the telemetry and the instrumentation does it as well. Um, they will you know, supply you with a graph of a call. They will supply you with all of the history, um, all of the services that a call traveled through and you have it at your disposal, right? You have a trace ID, you have a span ID for the individual, um, individual sections and subcomponents and you can really use that to um, to analyze more slos is a bit more in the hard analytics topic so you need an analytics engine that takes care of um, analyzing data over time keeping state it's not a trivial thing to do um, so our product has capabilities to do so but since we are talking about open telemetry which is not yet at the analytics stage, I would say, yes, you can do that. You just need a vendor that supports it. And then the follow-up question from uh, Redip, um, can we calculate SLOs with open telemetry? Yeah, for sure. So it collects uh, tracing, uh, metrics data, uh, log data, and whatever your objectives are made of, um, you can, uh, of course, use open telemetry for that. Right, so you would really be dependent on your vendor or your data uh, analytics engine. If you want to host it yourself, for example, with a prompt stack or um, you know some some Grafana product, for example, um, very popular choices. Um, there are mechanisms in these analytics engines, um, but it's really up to to you and your tool to settle for a best practices approach. And there's nothing that Open Telemetry will provide as a best practice it's up to you to, to define your goals can the tool monitor the flow between the clusters interesting question can you can you let me share my screen because the answer answer is yes i will show you a very cool feature of instana that i that i failed to highlight and this is really a pity it's my bad. It's my bad. So, um, the first things first. Open telemetry does not care if your distribute if your um, transactions just happen on a local host, but they can be distributed by nature. They can go beyond a single cluster. They can go to your payment provider. They can go through your um, cloud edge provider, for example, if they support tracing. Um, for example, you know, Cloudflare has, has an option to do that. And it's really about the data collection. If you can get the data, sure, you have this distributed transaction, and it really doesn't care where it's running. Is it run, starting in a Kubernetes cluster, ending in a Lambda function, 
traveling through a cloud run container and then um, whew, maybe at some point also going through a mainframe. That's perfectly possible. But one thing our tool does is uh, we do infrastructure correlation, right? I, I said it briefly, but for every span, so for every sub interaction that we denote here, we can pinpoint to the specific process with, with its physical context. Here's, a, Kubernetes, here's a, a Linux machine. It's hosting a Kubernetes cluster. Um, there is a Docker container involved, Kubernetes pod, and I can directly jump to the, that specific Python um, process and see its metrics. I can directly judge the health. And if you are talking about like really, really taking this, the distributed aspect beyond what I just said, if you want to make infrastructure correlation, you will need some additional help, but it's perfectly possible. It's actually support. It's, it's, it's the reason why distributed tracing exists. Yeah, that's all for questions. Any any other questions? I just see that we have five minutes left. No further questions, great. That does, does either, either mean it was too much information or you're all busy Googling out on telemetry right now, which you should. Our positioning against Dynatrail. Okay, now we are getting to the, uh, to the hard crash. So since we're not focusing on competitive positioning here, I would rather like to take the discussion offline. So my contact infos are available. If you wanna have that discussion, hit me up. All right, well, thank you so much to Martine and Cedric for their time today. And thank you to all the participants who joined us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today. And we hope you're able to join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thanks for joining.